Well, good morning, church. Welcome to Stockport Baptist Online. As we are still in lockdown, it means we cannot gather together in person yet. And like me, you probably miss singing with others in church. But the Bible is clear that humans are not the only part of creation able to praise God. The very air around us and the sky with its sunsets and magnificent clouds declare the goodness of God. What we already know from scripture, scientists are discovering today. A recent study reported that a regular dose of childlike wonder achieved by taking a weekly oar walk can help maintain a healthy mind. What is awe and wonder if not worship? God's created world evokes that awe in us and moves us to wonder. As Paul tells us, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made. Romans 1.20 In these strange times of Christians being scattered with limited gatherings, could we rediscover the natural cathedral of God's creation? As we cannot gather to sing, perhaps we could listen to the skies instead. There is something special about being outside to worship God. The traditional indoor spirituality of church has distanced us from the natural outdoor spirituality that we see in the Bible. Do we only expect to encounter God during short moments in specific buildings rather than the everyday experiences of garden, park and footpath? If we expand our view of God to see his involvement in the changing seasons, the grandeur of star constellations and the minute detail of the bacteria living in our soil, we may start to bridge the gap between what we consider sacred and what we tend to think of as secular. Worshipping in God's creation might also change our attitude towards the planet. Just as no healthy Christian would trash their church building, so the outdoor worshipper will experience a newfound respect for treading lightly on the earth. How could you encounter God through his creation this week? Let's listen to a call to worship based upon Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are much more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned. In keeping them there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. 
May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We've received the latest newsletter from our Link missionaries, Helen and Witt Boondeacon, uh, who are based, as we know, in Thailand and who came to see us um, last year, didn't they? And uh, we want to continue to remember them and pray for them. So I thought this morning it would be good if we shared some news about them and their situation, and then we pray for them. And I'll lead you in a prayer for them. But first of all, um, I've downloaded the latest video that they've sent, which gives us uh, an update for what's been happening back in their own village. So let's watch that and then I'll lead us in a prayer for them and for BMS. Hello, I'm Witt and this is Helen. And we were working with BMS a church planters in the village of Wang Dang in northern Thailand. 
We've been here for nearly four years and now we have a little congregation of about eight adults and ten children. Thailand is not as badly affected by coronavirus as many other countries, but there are still many restrictions here. For example, we can't hold gatherings of more than 10 people. And also, when we go outside, we have to wear a face mask. It has meant that we have had to stop our Sunday services, Bible studies and children activities. But I am still able to go to visit people individually, armed with hand gel and with face mask. <laughs> Four of us, our believers, also come on the Thursday morning for a time of encouragement from God's Word and for prayer. And we meet with two others on a Friday morning. The basket weaving and sewing projects have had to stop for a while as there is currently no market for these kinds of products. The three ladies in the sewing project had been making masks, face masks, but now even that has had to stop. I can still go visiting people in the village to offer encouragement, hope and pray. And we have offered our help locally and in any way we can. We have been giving our food bags to those in need and Helen also got involved with adding cloth square for making face masks, yeah. which were then distributed to everyone in the community. As it's summer now, uh, the schools have closed and English classes have also stopped. But I've been volunteer teaching to teenagers twice a week which has been great fun and I'm going to start teaching another lady soon via Zoom. We also have a prayer meeting with local pastors every Tuesday morning again via Zoom. We want you to know that we are praying for all of you in the UK. If you have any specific prayer requests then please let us know and for us Please could you pray for our believers to stay strong in their faith and pray that they can share their hope and faith with their friends and families. Please also pray for other BMS workers around the world who are striving hard to make a difference in the lives of many people. Don't forget to visit the BMS website for more details. And if you want to contribute to the coronavirus appeal, you can do so at www.bmsworldmission.org forward slash coronavirus hyphen appeal. We want to say a big thank you for your faithful support. Without you, we cannot be able to serve God here. So you and us, we are all serving and partnering with God's kingdom together. So may God bless you and keep you well and trust in Him alone. Bye bye. So they've asked for particular prayer points, and uh, I'll lead us now uh, in a prayer for these particular prayer requests. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the work that Helen and Witt do in this. Uh, town of, or this village of Wangdang and uh, Father we just uh, particularly pray now for some of their needs at this time they, we pray for their membership to grow in their faith and we pray that uh, one of uh, the ladies Pratham that she recovers from an operation and that Mr Goat uh, that he has victory over alcoholism we also uh, want to commend Quan to you, uh, who needs healing, and her parents, Charles and Kay, to begin Bible study. And we pray for Fluck for, uh, to give him confidence in the football training. And also we pray for Helen's English classes. 
We give thanks for our sala and we pray that it might be a place of peace and blessing. And it also might be uh, an, an extra income for Pratham and for Tar. And lastly, we pray for the basket weaving and sewing projects to, con to continue to flourish. They've also asked for prayer as well for their youth camp, which will be happening there from the 24th to the 26th of October. So in fact, it's already happened, hopefully. And it, uh, it, it will have been run by a team from Sang Soang Baptist, our partner church in Bangkok. So we do pray for a continued openness to the gospel and that more people would come to faith. And we do pray for Wit and Hel Helen, for good health, for energy and enthusiasm to continue in the task that the Lord has given them to do there. So we lift all these prayers up to you, our Father, and we ask that in your mighty name that you will anoint Helen and Wit particularly at this time and protect them, keep them safe, and may they bring be a blessing to that community where they are. So we ask all these things in and through your precious son's name. Amen. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honour at banquets and the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to be called rabbi by others. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Normally at this time of year, many people in this country pay good money to go to the theatre to see an age-old story that they've seen many times before with a paper-thin plot, with dodgy jokes and with a third-rate actor dressed up as a fat old woman. Yes, folks, it's pantomime time. This year, probably not going to be happening. But it's a, an age-old tradition, isn't it, in our country? And as we, or certainly as I read this passage this week, um, I was, I was reminded, really, just through Jesus' interactions of pantomime. He's in full pantomime mode. OK, maybe he's not wearing tights, but he has got the, the pantomime villains, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. There's some great jokes in there. And the audience participation, well, we can only imagine. I think there must have been a good deal of that going on. So you imagine the setting, he's in the temple courts. Now the temple courts with this massive area, probably um, two football pitches, really, really large area of, of, of courtyard. And, and, and he's, he's got this, this gathering within there. Um, we know from uh, the previous chapter that he's just had this exchange with, with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. So they're, they're there. 
it's kind of where they hang out anyway <clears throat> and uh, and he's got he's got his disciples they they're sort of you know, probably to one side sitting together you know sort of basking in the the reflected glory of Jesus we are with that guy and then there's the crowd we don't know how many but they're described as a crowd so it's it's a fair few and uh, so you know there's a, a, a reasonable size gathering here and uh, and Jesus starts to to address uh, the, the 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 crowd and the disciples to start with and he, and he says to them he says this um, he said the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses seat now what does he mean by that well he he, he means that they, they speak with a certain authority because um, they're, they're recognized uh, teachers uh, learned people who who know uh, the law of Moses, they understand it, and uh, they they are qualified to teach it. Um, and 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 the law in itself is is sacrosanct. You know, it's at the core of the Jewish faith. So these people sit in Moses' seat. They 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 speak, therefore, with with some authority. So he says, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. So, you must obey them and do everything they tell you. And you can imagine at this point a, a gasp from the crowd, thinking, "Has he changed his tune? He's normally he's got he's got a lot of harsh words to say against the Pharisees, against the teachers of the law, and now he's saying, do what they tell you to do.' Ah, but then he says, "But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach." And at that moment, of course, the audience falls about laughing they get the the punchline and uh, and 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 this, this i think this this sort of sets up how how this 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 uh, passage is going to go it's it's great oratory from jesus and as he warms to a subject he, he layers on the comedy he says everything they do is done for men to see they make their phylacteries wide and the tassels of their garments long I don't hear any laughter. Well, that's because you probably don't get the joke. See, phylacteries were these little boxes that the Orthodox Jews would literally uh, bind to their foreheads. Um, and within those little boxes were some of the sacred scriptures. And um, this all goes back to the the the, um, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, um, and and in there in the Deut in Deuteronomy it says, "Bind the commandments on your foreheads." So literally, they did. They they took some of the commandments, put them in their box, and had them bound to their foreheads. And and the prayer shawls, that so the tassels he talks about, um, were were um, at the four corners of their prayer shawls. And these four tassels were, according to the Book of Numbers, to remind them of the commands. And so when when Jesus says they they wear their phylacteries wide and their tassels long, one can only imagine that that that. Um, where what started as a, a, an act of devotion, you know, literally binding the the, the law to your forehead, so you you, you know it, it's constantly there, reminded you're reminded of it. So it's 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 gone from being a a, a reminder of devotion to being a, a symbol of of piety. So no longer is it just a little box, but somehow these boxes have become bigger. Um, and, and the tassels that were there to remind them of the commandments, they've got longer. It's almost like these guys are really holy. They've got big phylacteries and long tassels. It's a bit like um, in Victorian England, you know, top hats became the thing, which if you think about it, they're a bit weird, aren't they? But it was, it was like the taller your hat, the more important you were. And so here's the joke, you know, is is the crowd would have loved it. They'd have got it straight away because Jesus is is pointing out truth here. Uh, he's not making this up. He's, he's he's drawing this to their attention, and they know it. And they probably got their own private jokes about the religious leaders anyway. So um, this this is this is 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 riffing now 
Um, and you, you can you can see it's like one of these these black preachers in the Pentecostal churches. You know they 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 get into this rhythm and uh, and this this is Jesus. But this is no stand up routine. Um, you know he's not just doing this for fun. But like any great comedy, it has truth behind it, and and, and you use comedy to to reveal truth, to get behind our defences. Jesus is getting their attention. And then he really lets rip. I've had it with you. You're hopeless, you religion scholars, you Pharisees. Frauds. Your lives are roadblocks to God's kingdom. You refuse to enter and won't let anyone else in either. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees frauds. You go to halfway around the world to make a convert, but once you get him, you make him into a replica of yourselves, double damned. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You keep meticulous account books, tithing on every nickel and dime you get, but on the meat of God's law, things like fairness and compassion and commitment, the absolute basics, you carelessly take it or leave it. Careful bookkeeping is commendable, but the basics are required. Do you have any idea how silly you look, writing a life story that's wrong from start to finish, nitpicking over commas and semicolons? You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You burnish the surface of your cups and bowls so they sparkle in the sun, while the insides are maggoty with your greed and gluttony. Stupid Pharisee. Scour the insides, and then the gleaming surface will mean something. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees. Frauds. You're like manicured grave plots, grass clipped and the flowers bright, but six feet down, it's all rotting bones and worm-eaten flesh. People look at you and think you're saints, but beneath the skin, you're total frauds. You're hopeless, you religion scholars and Pharisees. Frauds. You build granite tombs for your prophets and marble monuments for your saints. And you say that if you had lived in the days of your ancestors, no blood would have been on your hands. You protest too much. You're cut from the same cloth as those murderers and daily add to the death count. Snakes, reptilian sneaks. Do you think you can worm your way out of this? Never have to pay the piper? It's on account of people like you that I send prophets and wise guides and scholars generation after generation. And generation after generation, you treat them like dirt, greeting them with lynch mobs, hounding them with abuse. So you get the message, don't you? And if you're ever wondering why, humanly speaking, Jesus was executed, well, look no further than this passage. He really knows how to get under people's skin. And, uh, you know, by the time it, it comes for, for Jesus' trial, these guys are a dead set against him. So... What was the, the sin of the, 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 the Pharisees and the teachers of the law? Because you know, they, they rightly understood you know, that they, these, these were serious minded people and, and their, their concern was for the, 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 the salvation of Israel. And um, you know, they hated the fact more than anyone that, that they were under Roman oppression and that they couldn't practice their religion in a, 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 a free way. So they rightly understood that, that Israel were, was a, a chosen people, the chosen people. And they'd been chosen to be a light to the other nations. But, and you just need to read the Old Testament to, to, to get a feel for this, 
repeatedly as a nation they fell away from uh, the, the, the God, godly path that they were directed along. And so you've got the, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Habakkuk, all of the prophets, that their job was to bring them back, bring them back to God's ways. They've gone astray and they need to be brought back on track. The Pharisees knew this. They knew this well. And they also knew that by the time... Um, that Israel was, was, was carted off to Babylon, to exile. This was, this was the ultimate uh, sanction, if you like. This was the ultimate judgment on their repeated failure to uphold uh, God's ways. They get that and they got it right. And they then saw that the, the, the current Roman oppression, which is it's probably about 60 years or so that the, the Romans have, have been in occupation in Palestine at, at this time. So that they, they see this as, as God's further judgment. And as far as the Pharisees are concerned, their solution for this is that the Jews should uphold the, the details of the law. They, they should, they should uh, and, and there were lots of them. There was over 600 um, laws and regulations laid down in the, um, in the Pentateuch, the first five books. So as far as they were concerned, uh, it, was, it was Israel's failure to comply with these rules uh, that, that meant that they no longer had their freedom. If, if they could only just be brought back to, to following all of these things, um, then they would have freedom from oppression. They would receive their salvation. But they missed the point. They missed the point. Their focus, as, as, as Jesus highlights here, their, their, their focus was on, on complying with, with detail of, of ritual and rules as interpreted by them. And, and in the process, missing the bigger picture of justice, of love, of mercy. Their failing was that they focused on the outward behaviour and forgot the transforming power of God's law on the human heart. So that it was all outward while inward was all rotten. Their focus was on what we can do to earn God's approval. And in the process, missing the, the overwhelming grace and compassion of God. Instead of leading people to God, they blocked the way. They led people down blind alleys of rule keeping, preventing them from living freely. And they honoured the prophets, the ones who had called out Israel for its sin. And yet they rejected the prophet who was in their midst at that moment. They got it wrong at every turn. Last week, Steve spoke about um, the, the, the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. And the irony is that it's this very scripture that these people had in their phylacteries. This is the scripture that, would, that resided against their forehead constantly. And, and yet... It appears they failed to properly understand it and apply it. Now, before we come down too hard on the Pharisees, I think it's fair to say that their failings are, are, are the same as the failings of much of religion when it goes wrong. Humans quite easily fall back into that default position of wanting to earn God's approval. And when we do that, we tend to focus on the things that we can do, the things that we can do. And once you've gone down that route, the, the leaders tend to get puffed up because they become powerful in their administering the, the requirements of, of what God needs. 
So they get puffed up and, and the people become burdened and, 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 and uh, with heavy loads that they have to carry in order to, to win God's approval according to the rules set down. But all of this misses the point that we all fall short of God's glory, as Paul says. We all fall short of God's glory. And so it, it is easy to take pot shots at the Pharisees. They're, they're not here to defend themselves. And I'm sure they're a lot better than maybe uh, the impression we have of them. Um, but whether we're, we're new to, to Christian ideas or maybe especially if we are, um, uh, have been Christians for, for, for many years, uh, it, it's, it's such an easy trap to fall into to forget that we're all in need of a saviour. Jesus elsewhere talked about the, um, the story of the shepherd seeking after the lost sheep. He had, he had 100 sheep, one of them went missing. And so the shepherd goes looking for this lost sheep. Now, I don't know a lot, a lot about sheep, but um, I, I'm told, and I think you can observe it quite clearly, they are a bit stupid not being unkind because they're lovely aren't they but they are a bit stupid um, and it's interesting this is not the story of the lost dog if it was the story of the lost dog that the, the shepherd would have gone and found the dog um, and as soon as as he made contact the dog would come to him he'd leap up on him or whatever and he would follow the shepherd home no problem that's what dogs do isn't it no this this is sheep in this story, the shepherd goes, he finds the sheep. Now, he can't just walk home expecting the sheep to follow. It won't. That's not what sheep do. He has to bind up the sheep, front legs and back, and carry it on his shoulders to take, take it home. You see, the, the sheep is incapable of doing anything to save itself. That's just what sheep are like. And so we are powerless to save ourselves. Yes, we can be good. I'm not saying that we're bad all the time and, you know, oh, woe is me. But, um, you know, of course we can be good. We can be very good some of the time. And then we sin again. Then we go off the rails. Then we lose the plot. Then we miss the point and wonder off in the wrong direction and have to be brought back again and again. We need the intervention of a saviour on a regular, constant basis. And we trust in his saving power rather than on our own efforts. We can then relax knowing that he's got our backs. We don't need to fuss about making sure we've complied with every little rule. No, no, he died in order that we can be forgiven. We can trust him entirely and relax. That's not to say we can then just sit around watching telly. We can, um, but the expectation is that we, we respond then in love living lives that please God and bless our neighbour. Now, if you start in the wrong place, you, you'll, you'll, you'll end up going um, wildly astray. So if, if your starting point is that um, you need to jump through hoops to win God's approval, then everything else that follows will get skewed and distorted. If that's your starting point, oh, I, I need to do this, 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 this and this, otherwise God will be displeased. You're going to go off, off track. You're going to be worshipping a God that gets angry at your failures. You're going to be fearful at the consequence of those failures. You're going to live in a world that's competitive. You know, am, I, am I doing as well as this person? And you'll be working with wrong motives, constantly seeking approval. But if you start knowing that you can never, by your own efforts, be good enough, relying instead on God's grace, 
God's unmerited favour every day, then the rest falls into place because then you're, you're worshipping a God who, who knows and understands our failures. You're then not getting hung up on failure, but repenting when it happens, moving on, knowing it's dealt with, not a problem, and then giving our lives as we work with him in blessing the world around us. So whether you've been a Christian for 90 years or you're just exploring, if you're living feeling that you have to earn God's approval and others, you don't. You do not need to seek approval. That way leads only down the path of the Pharisees. Rather, come to him in prayer, accepting you'll never make it on your own, accepting his saving sacrifice on your behalf and receiving him into your life. Then you can get on with following him, living free from those burdens. And I'll just close with a, um, a well-known verse that Jesus spoke. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So thanks to Ken for reminding us that like the Pharisees, we can all miss the point. We can all fall short of God's glory and there's nothing we can do to earn God's approval. We are powerless to save ourselves, but we have a savior who gave himself for us. He died for you and for me. And as unbelievable as that is, it's true. God's love for us is immeasurable. And it's perfectly summed up in the words of our closing song. Who am I that for my sake, my Lord should take frail flesh and die? My song is love unknown, my Saviour's love to me, love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake Lord should take frail flesh and die. He